Hey everyone, welcome to Tea and Chocolate. I'm absolutely uh, excited today to have a wonderful guest. Her name is Jennifer Kaufman. She is the director of a film that I think everyone should check out. It's called There's Got to Be More to Life. And uh, Jennifer will give you a proper introduction, but just some uh, information. She was one of the injured people in the uh, Boston Marathon uh, bombing. Do you remember that? That happened in April of uh, 2013, April 15th to be exact. There were three people that killed and there were hundreds that were injured and 17 lost their limbs. So, um, you know, Jennifer, thank you for coming or joining me today. We're actually not coming. <laughs> we're coming to our screen. Uh, thank you. And I want to thank Judy Miller for connecting us. So thank you, Judy. Yeah, thank you for having me, Lauren. It's a pleasure being with you today. Right. Okay. So why don't you start off by giving me the int an introduction? I um, was really intrigued by there's some real golden nuggets that you say in the film throughout, mm -hmm. which really said to me, "This is her intuition um, speaking to her." Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Let's let me go. let me start with um, so born and raised outside of Boston, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. um, went to undergrad, grad school, was very accomplished in the corporate world. Um, I left there in my mid thirties because I was burnt out. I started my own company at that time, focusing on business consulting and business coaching for small and mid-sized companies. And in 2012, um, my clients and I came off our best years in business. So I decided I was gonna take a couple of months off for sabbatical and just enjoy my time in, the, um, in Mexico and also in Arizona. One of my passions for about five years was to go to Miraval Spa and Resort, the one that Oprah Winfrey used to rave about. And as it turned out, Louise Hay and Cheryl Richardson's were doing women's retreat there in early Feb. Oh, okay. So I went there and little did I know that that retreat was going to prepare me for what was gonna happen a couple months later. Wow. So my intuition led me there. And um, I didn't care about the name of the retreat, candidly. All I knew was it was a woman's retreat and it was at a spa that I had been wanting to go to for five years. So I signed up and I go. When I get there, I realized the name of the uh, retreat is Extreme Self Care, based on Cheryl Richardson's book. And I thought to myself, what do I need extreme self care for? And I, I say this because it is a precursor to what I'm about to share about the bombings. So I distinctly remember Cheryl asking the question, what gets in the way of extreme self-care? I was one of the few people that raised my hand. And I said, well, when I have too much downtime, I notice I get really angry and irritable. And I don't like to be angry and irritable. So I go and do something else. And so... For most of my life, I had been running from my childhood trauma because I didn't know how to process it. I didn't know how to deal with it. And so I was, I turned into an overachiever and I had a lot of success, but I never was fulfilled. So fast forward, I'm at the Boston Marathon, April 15, 2013, my first ever marathon, never had a desire to go. But a dear friend of mine asked if I would accompany her because I know my way around the city very well. So I said yes. And uh, the day started out really great. And I was actually quite inspired by the, uh, the marathon itself. And then we ended up in the finish line and we were about 25 feet from the actual crossing of the finish line. And we were watching her son waiting for him to, to come across. And he was about a half mile out when the first of two explosions went off. Oh, okay. And yeah, the first explosion went off. I thought it was a gas explosion. And there was a 12 seconds between the first and second explosion. My recollection would have you say it was minutes because that's what it felt like. Everything went into slow motion. And life as I knew it at that point was shattered. Everything that I had once known, once, you know, loved about my city and my community was, was gone, actually. And that, that led me down a path of learning how to heal the traumatic 
you know, aspects of my life and integrate that into who I am today. So I share that because I want your listeners to know it's a journey. And I want listeners to know that, you know, we, we grew up in a society and a culture that these so-called negative emotions are not, um, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't go there. We shouldn't experience them, right? We should numb them. We should pretend like they're not there. Yeah. And that's not authentic. We have them for a reason. Now let's be clear. Um, it's not appropriate to lash out and, and use your rage um, against you know, someone else to harm someone else or yourself. Um, but what I realized was the more that I harbored this hidden anger, the more I was actually uh, diminishing my own light and diminishing my own, um, my own purpose here. Mm -hmm. So that was, that's, that's just a little bit about the backdrop. And then, you know, it's going on almost nine years now. And I never would imagine saying to you that the bombings were the most horrific day of my life. And now I can say to you the biggest gift of my life. Today, oh, yeah. today I produce transformational films that are intended to inspire, encourage, and empower people to rise up to their own greatness and to remember that they all have the God-given right to thrive. Every single person, no matter what the circumstance and no matter what the external environment is. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, so I, 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 when you, when you uh, touched on the running from childhood. I wonder if there was sort of a bit of a metaphor in running in a marathon. Absolutely. I wasn't running that day. I was a spectator, but the irony, um, uh, but okay. the irony is, hold on. I did go back and run. Uh, oh, okay. That was, okay. That was my <laughs> coming full circle. Uh -huh. that, but yes, like that is the irony, right? The irony is here I am running for myself. I'm at one of the most iconic marathons in the world. Mm -hmm as a spectator and that event literally stopped me in my track, brought me to my knees and I had to stop running for myself. I literally, I was physically, emotionally, mentally shattered from that experience. Mm -hmm. So I had no choice but to stop and to slow down. And when I didn't realize what happened, and this is what people need to understand about trauma is that, um, uh, Dr. Bessel van der Kolk wrote a book called Body Keeps the Score. And it basically talks about unresolved trauma lives in ourselves and stays stuck in ourselves. Mm -hmm. And if we don't do the work to process it and, and let it out, yeah. it literally yeah. diminishes our light and our ability to, to thrive. Mm -hmm. What happened after the bombings was I went into, my brain went into this loop. It's, you know, post-traumatic stress. And I would ke you kept looping over and over the bombings. But after a couple of days, not only was it the bombings, it was unresolved childhood trauma, unresolved young adulthood trauma. So I, I felt as though I was witnessing the most horrific horror movie of my life right before my eyes, and I couldn't make it stop. I didn't know how to make it stop. But I was guided my intuition guided me to go on this path to learn how to heal naturally, something I had zero knowledge how to do before. My background is in business. My background is in finance. I don't have a medical background at all. When I was in the hospital the day of the bombings in the ER, that was actually quite a bit traumatic experience for me. And um, I remember my body, I had so much pain in my body. Was just, can, yes. I just inter, can I just intervene? I yes. wanted to understand what actually happened to your physical body. So my physical body, I had, so because I was 15 feet from the first explosion. Okay. Literally, it literally blew, um, it, it shattered my energetic field, right? My, my aura, basically. But right. in addition to that, yeah. I was thrown into a cement barricade. And I was wearing a um, camera with a full lens. So I had a lot of abdominal um, swelling and injuries. Oh, dear. I had okay. spinal injuries and I had a mild traumatic brain injury. And I, I had the experience of all of my vital systems were no longer in sync. It was like they were fragmented. Mm -hmm. So my breath was no longer in sync with my heart. 
and all like I could just feel like, the only way I know how to describe it is imagine an electrical outlet mm -hmm. that's been frayed. It still has electricity running to it, but it's 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 you know, but it's not running in its full power. It's it's you know, and that's exactly how I felt. I couldn't walk normal for the first five months. I ended up seeing a chiropractor multiple times a week to be able to regain, regain my ability to walk. I saw a brain integration therapist. I didn't even know what that was, candidly, but a friend um, gifted me an appointment and that ended up being um, a pivotal mo moment in my healing journey early on. And what, what that did was it was like it was rewiring the neural pathways in my brain to my body that were were fragmented from the from the energetic explosion um, and then that just led down the path of learning how to heal naturally okay um there's something in the film that you said that when you woke up that day um uh, on the day of the uh, boston marathon you felt uneasy about actually attending i did Right. So that to me was, what do you describe that as? Like I could assume and call it so many things, but what would you describe that as? And would you say that, like, did you not listen to something or the opposite? Do you, do you get what I'm, yeah. I totally, I totally do. Yeah. Let me give you a little bit of a backstory. So mm -hmm. um, for whatever reason, mm -hmm. um, for years, my mom had tried to uh, encourage me to read the Bible from front to cover. I never, I never was able to do it. Okay. But for some reason, uh, I believe it was in 2012, um, the producer of the Survivor Show, he and his wife actually created a Bible series. And my mom had raved about it and said, listen, if you're not going to read it, oh, yeah. just, just watch this. Okay. As it turned out, I ordered the DVD. Mm-hmm. It arrived the week before the marathon. Okay. Now you have to understand, I barely had enough time to sit still to watch one two hour movie, mm -hmm. let alone if I recall correctly, that was an 11 or 12 hour series. Mm -hmm. I started watching it on Thursday. I watched it on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. The marathon is on a Monday. Okay. I can't okay. explain it. I right. cannot explain it, but I was drawn in. Mm -hmm. And I feel as though that was a nudge from my soul. Mm -hmm. And I had never been so captivated to sit still, but I would sit for two and a half, three hours each night. And I was just riveted to the TV screen watching right. this. Right. So I woke up the morning of feeling very unsettled. And I had this knowing I didn't want to go to Boston. I couldn't, I didn't have any other information. I was not aware of what was going to happen. Yeah. I just had this very unsettling feeling. And I remember speaking it to my mom. Mm -hmm. And my mom's like, well, if you feel that way, then don't go, don't, don't go to the finish line. Mm -hmm. And I said, I can't. I made a commitment to my friend. She doesn't know her way around the city. Mm -hmm. She's there to go see her son run for the first time. I'm not going to let my friend down. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's an excellent question. Looking back on it now, I don't regret it. My friend will say I saved her life. Yeah. Yeah. And if I had to go through that experience to save someone else's life, mm -hmm. I would actually do it again. Mm -hmm. Well, there's so many just um, intricacies just in what you're saying, because you talk about, you know, at the end of the day, you're, you, you know, we'll get to all that, but just the healing modalities that you used. Right. And so it really brings us back to ourselves. And the thing that you, that you are talking about is commitment and follow through because what I'm hearing is a person of integrity. Mm -hmm. And so, I, I, you know, and it's like, when do you put yourself others or when do you put yourself first before others? So I'm wondering if that went on a little bit uh, for you and that moment when you were having this discussion with your mom, because I mean, this is like a sliding door moment. You just, <laughs> um, you know, you mentioned that it, it changed your life. What do you think about that? Is that, is that? is that another lesson in there for you or? Well, here's the thing. I, at that moment, I've, I've thought about this quite a bit, actually. Mm -hmm. I was like, 
I didn't have any other information to base my decision at that time, other than I felt unsettled and I knew about Boston. I wasn't getting, we were going to the starting line and I didn't get a sense there. I just got a sense of Boston. Never in a million years Mm -hmm. could I fathom in the city that I was, I grew up in, I worked in, went to university in, that a bomb would ever go off. Never. So, so I sit there and I've, I've, I've gone over it a lot and I'm like, if I chose not to go, I felt as though I would be letting down a friend and he didn't have any other information to go on. Yeah. And I, I didn't want to let down a friend. That's the, and so, so in hindsight, I'm grateful I did what I did. Yeah. Cause that is actually who I am as a person. Yeah. When you, if you had you not gone, do you think you would have addressed your childhood trauma? No, I don't. Well, l- let me just say that. <laughs> Not unless another trauma happened. Oh, yeah, right. Right, right. So here's, here's what I've learned mm-hmm. is that, and this took years for me to understand this. So we are yep. all energy beings. We all yep. are electric beings. In mm-hmm. fact, I Amy Cusick writes about it. We're electric bodies. Yeah. But what happens is, and we actually emit a frequency. We can't hear it with our ears. But if you think about it, like the only way I know how to describe it is think about a guitar and you strum a guitar, and you can hear if it's out of tune or not. And if it's out of tune, you put a tuner on it, right? What happens is when we start to slow down and tap into our body, we can't necessarily hear the frequency, but we can feel when we're not in alignment. Mm -hmm. And when we address that, all is well. And by the way, we're constantly moving in and out of alignment because we're moving, right? We're, 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 we're beings that are on the go and we do things, right? So it's not practical to think we're 100% in alignment, but we can quickly get back there. Yep. But what I'm, what I'm saying is, is, that, is that what I now understand more than ever is that we create our realities and we emit frequency. So if we've got unresolved trauma, whether we can, this is this is the part that I've I've struggled with most of my life. Mm-hmm. Ever heard the term "fake it till you make it"? Yes. Trust yes. me, I tried that. I've tried it and tried it and tried it. Yeah. And I could fake it to a point, but I could never quite shift the energy vibration. And that's because it's what Dr. Sue speaks about in the film that it's hidden in our subconscious in the trap door. It's our blind spot. We don't even know it's there. Right. right. But what I do know is that, is that even when I had my accomplishments, there was a sense of struggle to get there, a sense of like hard work. You know, we, we grow up in, we grew up in a, uh, in a society where you, you got to work hard. And I used to believe that. I actually don't believe that anymore. Oh, really? But I, have, I don't. I actually, now it doesn't mean we don't work. Please don't misunderstand. But when we are in vibrational alignment with who we are and what our intentions and aspirations are, and we just stay in this, what I call childlike curiosity state, Mm -hmm. the universe will send you signs and synchronicities. You just got to take the breadcrumbs that that it lays down for you. But previously, I was like trying to make it work. It's like a fish swimming upstream. And I'd eventually get there but it took a lot of energy, took a lot of effort. And then it was just like, you get there and you're exhausted. You don't feel fulfilled. Mm-hmm. The other way is that you're in flow. And then there's a sense of fulfillment. There's a sense of, of knowing that you're divinely guided and you're divinely supported. Mm-hmm. And that everything happens for our highest good. You need to understand, I never believed any of that before. Right. So when, we, when you were in the hospital and in the early beginnings of this experience for you, what was the healing options, like what were the healing options that the allopathic medicine was offering you that you said no? Pain and medicine. Went on, pardon? Pain, med- pain medications, okay. sleep medications, anti-anxiety medications. I mean, you name it, like anything to numb what was going on. Right. But did you start off at the very least just to give your body a break or just to give you some reprieve? No, no, I didn't. So and there's a backstory to this too. So um, <laughs> you're layered with stories, Jennifer. I am, but, it, but it's, it's important to distinguish I it. why I got here. Yes. Cause that just didn't happen like that. 
So sure. I had, um, I struggled with anxiety, panic disorder, and depression mm -hmm. from teenagers to early adult and even in, in even to my mid, you know, my mid thirties. Mm -hmm. So I was on, I was on and off antidepressants, anti-anxiety meds. As a kid, I had a lot of ear infections and I was on a lot of antibiotics. So that actually impacts your gut flora and it yeah. impacts your liver. Right. Okay. So, so I didn't, I wasn't aware of all of that stuff then, but I'm now going back and dotting the I's and crossing the T's and starting to understand something and learning the insights and wisdom. Mm -hmm. Here's what happened. Um, I was 42 and the bombings took place. I was around 40 when I was just like, wow, I'm working out, I'm doing all these things, but my body's just not responding. And they don't feel great. And so I went and got some blood work done and it didn't reveal anything, right? It was like, doctors, like you're fine. And a friend of mine said, hey, I know this holistic, uh, I, this gentleman who does a different type of blood testing. He'll come to you. He does this thing and he'll read it under a microscope and he'll tell you what's going on. Oh, yeah. Like, ah. Okay. I actually did it. <laughs> I know what you're talking about. Yeah. And here's the thing. I never told the gentleman anything about my history. Oh. He takes my blood. He puts it under a microscope and he said, did you have a brain injury at some stage in your life? And I said, yeah, how do you know that? And then he pointed out how he could see it right. on the microscope. Right. Then he yeah. said, then he said, have you been on a lot of medications? Yes, I have. And you could see it in my liver. Mm -hmm. So, so anyways, I started to become aware of, oh my gosh, like, like my body has been really wrecked because of all of the medication I was taking. Mm -hmm. um, now I want to, I want to say something. I do believe medication has its place. Yep. And it serves. But if it's if it's if if somebody's telling you that you need it for the rest of your life, I would question it. That's just how I feel at this stage of my life. Right. Um, but anyway, so now I have that in the back of my mind. So I'm in the ER. I have doctors and, swar and uh, nurses swarming my bedside. Mm -hmm. I'm being poked and prodded, all kinds of tests. And I remember getting wheeled in for a CAT scan. It was either CAT scan or MRI. I don't remember exactly which one. Mm -hmm. And I remember the technician saying, I'm going to inject you with this, um, with this dye. Yeah. And you're going to yeah. feel like you're going to wet your pants. You're going to feel like you have a fever. And you're going to, it's going to taste, it, you're going to have this taste in your mouth like you're sucking on um, a penny. I don't want to feel any of those things. I already feel absolutely horrific. I don't want to compound it. And I remember crying, please don't put that stuff in, inside of me. Can't you run the test without it? The answer was no. And there was no one there other than me and the technician. So out of fear, I allowed her to inject my body with that because they were concerned I was bleeding on the inside. And if that went undetected, that I could bleed to death. So I literally was in this like, you know, do I take it? Do I not take it? I ended up succumbing to take it. And I felt every single symptom that she described and more. And I felt awful. And I thought, and I didn't know if I was going to live to see another day, candidly. And I thought to myself, is this how I want to go? No, absolutely not. And so I discharged myself that evening in the care of my aunt. And then the rest is history. I went on this path, not knowing at all how to heal naturally. Not at all. But, I, but the universe provided the right people at the right time. I simply had to go. I didn't even have to do anything. Literally, friends, like one friend's like, Jen, I, I got this appointment for you. You just need to show up. I paid for it. You just go. And I just had, a, had somebody take me there. And then I was like, oh my gosh, I have relief. I feel, I feel like just a, a little bit better. I'm going to keep trying this. And then it was like, you know, and then another modality would come into play. I learned that acupuncture is phenomenal for helping the body with pain. You don't need to take pain med. At least I didn't have to. So I started to learn how to, um, how to heal through all natural ways. Right. So right. how did you uh, feel physically, start, start to really physically feel better? Four years. How many? Four years. Wow, that takes a lot of patience. Four years. And for, three and a, for three and a half years, I lived with some amount of pain. 
How are you today? I feel great. Do you keep up with some of the modalities that you... I do. You do. I do. I don't need all of them, candidly, mm -hmm. but I yeah. do. I do. I use it as a form of maintenance and self-care. Yeah. yeah. Throughout the movie, you, 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 you spoke to the audience as, you know, one by one, the uh, healers were introduced. And one of the things that you said was, um, notice how it makes you feel when each, you know, <laughs> when each um, healer came up. And I'm wondering why you uh, said that. Because my path is my path mm -hmm. and everyone has to find their own path. Mm -hmm. So I did not want anyone to think that what I was prescribing my path is your path. That's actually right. not, that's not the case. So I wanted to share what my journey was like. Um, and actually there'll be more in the next film that I do, which is a sequence. And I go deeper into what I did later on. Okay. Uh, but what, um, for me, I wanted people to just say what resonates. So if there's something that I talk about in the film that resonates, trust your own instincts to go seek that information or go seek a healer in that modality. Right. Okay. And I'm really wanting people to return back to themselves and, and empower themselves to go on their own journey. Because mm -hmm. what I have discovered is when we do that, when we give ourselves permission to do that, I have found life becomes like a magic carpet ride. I want to be clear. There's twists and turns and ups and downs, and there's some scary parts and exciting parts and some challenging parts and, and some really amazing parts. Yeah. But it becomes an adventure. And there's an aliveness to it. And there's an ability to connect with people in a way in which I, I never had experienced before. Mm -hmm. So I had a lot of people around me, but I always keep people at arm's length prior to the bombings. Mm -hmm. Because I was afraid if they got too close, they would see that it was broken on the inside. Right. Now that I've integrated, so this is the other thing I learned, is that I thought I could someday outrun my trauma. Mm -hmm. It's not how it works. And, and yeah. it just creates yeah. a lot of suffering and a lot of struggle. Mm -hmm. When we can face the pain, process those emotions, and it doesn't have to take long, meaning it doesn't have to take a lifetime to do it. It's just, it's just leaning in. And what I've noticed is that our trauma is no different than the manure that you put on a plant to grow. And why do you say yes. that? Because it gives it, because I have come to understand that trauma, if we, if we allow us ourselves to shift our perspective, trauma can be like the, the fertilizer and the nutrients that are needed for you as an individual to rise up and blossom to your best self. Oftentimes, I, myself included, I viewed my trauma as something's wrong with me and I felt that I was being punished. Mm. When I started to become aware and it took a couple of years after the bombings because I was in this self inquiry of like, there has to be more to life. But I was like, what am I missing? And I was missing, I was coming at it from the, I never viewed myself as a victim. Here's the thing. I always viewed myself as a survivor, but the truth is mm -hmm. I was coming from victim mentality. Mm -hmm. Right. And so well, I was coming, I was coming from the lens of the victimhood. So I could only see that. Right. When I stepped outside of that mm -hmm. and became more the witness mm -hmm. and the observer, mm -hmm. I was able to go into a deeper place of awareness and curiosity and go, huh? What if this is happening happening for me and my highest good to put me on my soul's path, even though I might not know what that is at the time? Yep. So I can contribute what I'm here to contribute. Right. When you um, watch that series, that biblical series, were there any? Was there anything sp that specifically that? you can share that helped you on the path? Yeah. So for whatever reason, mm -hmm. I was very consciously aware that every time something bad was so-called bad was supposed to happen, uh, was going to happen in the film. There yeah. was this like awful 
storm, an eerie, like cold breeze that would come through, uh, or I perceived it as cold, right? But there was just like this, like gust of wind, and and um, and I I remember that in various scenes. I have no idea why I remember that. Here's the interesting thing. There was more to my intuition. So when we got close to the finish line, I was very aware. Now I've been to professional sporting events. I, I love sports. I'd never been to the Boston Marathon, as I indicated. And I said to my friend, oh, huh, that's weird. There's no formal security here. People can just come and go and like, there's no formal security. Okay. But then I let it go. We get close to the finish line. I'm five foot four. My friend's about five feet, right? So imagine that you're packed into a sidewalk in the city of Boston and people are like sardines cheering and, and you know, screaming and all excited. Well, we knew that her son was close to crossing the finish line at this stage. So we didn't sit there to watch people's backs and the back of their heads, right? So we needed to find a way. And I remember feeling this nudge and when I looked back, nobody was close enough to physically touch me, but I felt this nudge. And when I turned back um, to look you know, forward again, I saw this, like a couple of people leave and I was able to grab my friend and we were to you know, scurry into this spot. What I didn't know is I was standing next to the bomber. I never saw him, I never knew that, but I was standing almost next to where he was when I got that nudge. And fortunately, I was, I was able to see that, oh my gosh, we could go a little bit further down and we can actually get right up to the barricade. Mm -hmm. Next thing happened. Now I remember looking down at my phone and I'm like, oh, he's close. He, you know, he's, he's about a half mile out. So we're getting all excited. And out of nowhere, there was this eerie gust of wind that was bone chilling cold. I said to my friend, I'm like, oh my gosh, like that was just like, oh. And she goes, I know. And I go, I'm gonna get a cup of tea after, after Dan crosses the finish line. And then the next thing I remember, I'm on the ground. And I heard this loud explosion. Wow, that's quite that's poignant. Mm. Uh, okay. Um, tell me what, has your, do you, tell me what your purpose is today, as opposed to prior to pre, pre, uh, pre Boston marathon, how has that shifted? Oh, it's a hundred percent shifted. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I no longer do, you know, traditional business coaching and business consulting work. Mm -hmm. I've actually now gone on to write three books. Um, I'm working on my fourth. I produced two Mission for Good films, all focused on veterans' causes, because here's one of the things, even though I'm not personally a veteran myself, mm -hmm. what, I, what I learned through the rising up of my own post-traumatic stress disorder, which I now no longer have, actually, um, what, what I learned was I need to be able to share my insights and wisdom right. with the veteran right. community. So I, I was told early on, don't bother. They'll never accept you because you're not one of them. And I, I just remember being so devastated. I said, I, I don't pretend to be one of them. I don't want to be one of them. I think I can learn from them. They were trained to be around bombs. I wasn't. So I think they can help me and I think I could help them. And I think that we could form some sort of bridge. And so I didn't allow my initial rejection, if you will, to stop me. It took a while, but I ended up meeting this woman who served for 28 years in the army. And she's like, I'll help you. And so she introduced me to, you know, other veterans who are doing nonprofit work. I got an opportunity to do two films where I could produce and share awareness of this. I couldn't imagine in my wildest dreams, Lauren, I thought my path was business and business coaching and, right. and all of that. And please don't misunderstand. I love it. But I could only serve so many people. And I always knew, I always had this longing. I wanted to be like a Wayne Dyer or like a, you know, uh, Louise Hay type of person, but I didn't have that kind of stuff. But, but deep down I was, or Tony Robbins, right. You know, to some degree, I always wanted to serve a lot of people. But in the work that I did, I could only serve a few. 
little did I know that this experience, when I got to the other side of it, would give me that opportunity to serve and to help. My intention is to help millions of people to stop surviving or to go from surviving to thriving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's my life's work. How I do that is through film, through books, through courses that I teach or retreats that I do and, and, and actually collaborative work with others. It's not just me. We're on this journey together. That's so clever. So uh, I love that with the veterans and that. Yeah, I feel, I feel, here's the thing. What I learned about veterans that I absolutely love, that I feel we, we miss in the civilian world. So they train, right? And they train and they have what they call, I've got your six, which basically means I've got your back. And there's a vow that they take in their troops that I've got your back, I've got your back, I've got your back. And no matter what, we're going to protect each other. What would life be like if we had that in the civilian world? Well, that's a great point because they live with such conviction. Yeah. Yeah, it's Learning. quite noble. And, and, and it's based on their word, which is really interesting because we don't seem to, we've forgotten that the power of our word should be like signing a document. That's how powerful it should be. But I really feel that we've lost that. It's integrity. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and they take a vow because for them, it's life or death. And I think this is where the difference is. In the civilian world, we don't take it as seriously. We don't view it as life and death. Mm. But here's the interesting thing. You know, my mom used to say, listen, if you can count on five hands how many people that are truly going to be there in your life, you're truly blessed. Yeah. I thought, no way. I've got more people in my circle. <laughs> she was right. It's, it's, she's, so, she's so right. Yeah. In fact, in fact, the people that I perceived as my inner circle then mm -hmm. all fell away. And not because they didn't love me, not because they didn't care about me, mm -hmm. but they all of a sudden saw this strong, vibrant woman, no longer strong and vibrant, and curled up in a ball, terrified. Okay, so what about the friends that pointed you and like gave you these appointments, like these, they gifted you these? Um... They weren't in my inner circle. Ah, Okay. They were not, they were, they were my friends, mm -hmm. but I perceived them as more, you know, like, you know, we, we had done some transformational courses together and they were friends, but they were not my best, my best buds at the Got time. You. Got you. Um, when it comes to, I've got a couple of questions still. Um, hmm. Who, when it comes to your soul, how would you describe your soul today? Evolving, mm -hmm. evolving, ascending, um, I would say um, empowering mm -hmm. and courageous. We, I feel we are in times mm -hmm. where we're, we're at a crossroads. We, yes. we, and and I, feel, I feel it's a planetary piece, right? The, the yeah. pandemic, yeah. we can live in fear. And listen, I know what that's like. I've done it before the bombings. I lived most of my life in fear. Yeah. It's valid. Um, and it's a choice. Or we can live courageously, faithfully. Mm -hmm. But that requires being okay with uncertainty. It requires being okay with being uncomfortable. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, you know, I think that, well, when it comes to this you know, you and I have spoken privately about what's going on in the world. And, you know, that's the deep question I have. How can you live in a place of courageous uh, courage and trust when you just saw something really sad happening across the globe where something's happening around this thing? We actually, I don't know if we have, like the people are actually go going to be the ones to stop sort of how this is being dealt with, because there seems like it's a little bit of uh, sinister action going on. And, you know, I'm wondering if you can speak on that, like how we can actually live in a place of peace knowing, because, you know, 
maybe we are so privileged today that we can actually think like that and that we can live in that way. But what about people like people in North Korea? They have absolutely no idea what joy feels like, you know, mm -hmm. except for Noemi Park, who wrote the book on, mm -hmm. you know, um, or, you know, our, our, our ancestors who went through, you know, they weren't sort of sitting there manifesting what their dreams were. They were about to hit the chamber, you know, I mean, so this sort of idea that we absolutely have 100% control, which brings me to this other question. If you've got some thoughts mulling over, please share it. But the difference, the, 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 the line between being used in life by the universe or by God and manifesting, what's the difference between that? You know what I'm saying? How does that come together? Do so we feel, have, yeah, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, I, I feel, so let me ask you answer the first question, right? It's, it's yeah. really poignant, mm -hmm. right? Nobody ever wants to go through a terrorist attack or a Holocaust or a mass shooting or whatever, bombing. right? Or bombing, anything. But, but, but nor do people want to lose a loved one to COVID or lose their job to COVID or anything like that, right? Absolutely. I, I want to say this. I personally believe every person on the planet has experienced trauma of some form. Mm -hmm. We're not here to compare our traumas, stories, or the, or the experience. That's not what this is about. Mm -hmm. But when you can put aside whatever that experience was, mm -hmm. when we boil down the process of, of, of working through that, we can relate, right? We can, we, you know, it's not about, you know, whether you lost a loved one or you lived in a terrorist attack or you, you know, unfortunately, a family member was put into a gas chamber. It's awful. But here's, here's what I know. Without contrast, we can't grow. Without darkness, we don't have light. I cannot, I cannot sit here and say, it's hard for me to say because you know, I don't ever want anyone to experience harm. And yet, until we can find a way to come back to ourselves and reignite the light within us to rise up so that we no longer are victims to other people who are trying to put harm and trying to suppress and trying to minimize. And, and how does that, and to answer your question about North Korea, I, I believe it just takes a village to start to create a ripple. And then that ripple gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And we can hope and pray that someday that even penetrates the people that have been you know, suppressed in North Korea and other parts of the world too. And so, and, and, and I believe that the, the, okay, here's the thing. I'm going to say a statement and both are true. The bombings were the most horrific experience of my life. That is the truth. What is also the truth is that it is become the biggest gift of my life. So both can be true. And so what if the pandemic is actually intended to bring that contrast or to bring us back to ourselves and to our in, in, back home, so to speak, so that we can cultivate and empower and inspire ourselves to rise up in whatever way that looks for ourselves. But we, we often, get stuck about our external factors. I can't control that the wind is blowing right now, but sometimes I wish I could because it affects my, <laughs> and it affects my ability to talk to you, right? But I can't, right? Yeah. So I can only accept, I don't have to like it, but I have to accept it. But what can I control? I can control how I'm responding to that. Now I can be really pissed off and sometimes I am because it's inconvenient. And I'm using this, you know, I'm using this as an example, but the truth is you can apply this to any aspect of life. It's all, we get to choose how we respond. Now, sometimes we respond in being pissed off and that's okay. The key is to shift it though, not to stay stuck in it. Like, cause the wind's not gonna go away cause you're pissed off at it. It just, right. it just right. stays. Right. But the more right. you can just accept it and go, okay, wait a minute. Do I really want to feel this way right now? Can I just let it go? Because in this moment, I can choose to be happy. I used to play this game with my niece, right? 
my nie one of my nieces and I used to play these games. She loved, for some reason, she loved, you know, like Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse. So I'm like, like show me Minnie Mouse, you know, sad face. She showed me a sad face. And, and then I'm like, show angry face, show happy face. In a second, she could shift and make you believe that she was either sad, angry, or happy. A kid, we forget that we have that very same ability. Mm -hmm. Because we are, we have layers and layers of crap that we've, you know, in years and years of these limiting beliefs and these limiting programs because of how we were raised and what was passed down from our ancestors. And this is, this is not to blame, but we can choose in this moment. Do I want to continue on that path and, and, and let that carry on for generations? Or do I want the buck to stop here with me right. and shift right. and pivot? Right. Right. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you for You're that. Um, tell me what you've learned from um, anger and forgiveness. The quicker you let it go, the quicker you find peace. So I, I want to share. This is actually kind of funny. I say it's funny now. So I so year one was all about rising above my terror and fear. Year two was rising above my rage and my inner terrorist. Yeah. <laughs> Here's the irony. Sorry, that is kind of funny. It is funny. It's the truth. <laughs> I would silently contemplate how I would take those two young men's life. Well, one of them had already deceased at this point, but I was so rageful because I thought my life was good and I thought that they ruined it. Right, right. Here's the thing. Mm -hmm. At this stage, I'm in the second year of my healing. Mm -hmm. And I, like, in, in my practitioner said to me, I would go through several layers of healing. Mm -hmm. And when my body was physically a little bit stronger, then wave of emotions would start to come up, right? And so our bodies are really amazing, really amazing at protecting us and, and only allowing us to process what, when we're ready. Um, so now my rage comes up. Every time I would experience rage, I would have a setback in, how, in my physical ability. Mm. And I get more rageful. And then I'd have a further setback. And I realized, crap, this isn't working. I mean, I have a right to be pissed off. I have a right to be angry. My entire life was shattered yeah. on every yeah. level. Right. But that wasn't serving me. And I was hoping and praying that all of my rage and anger was going to somehow affect that young man who's now 19, 20 years old sitting in a prison cell. He wasn't thinking about me. So this is when the forgiving the unforgivable came up. And this is when I was guided to forgiveness. And I, I went into it kicking and screaming. How can you forgive someone that, that did that to you? I struggled with it. I had an opportunity to write a victim impact statement. And it's a legal process through the court. And you, that can have influence on what happens to, um, you know, in this case, Johar Zanayev. Um, I don't refer to him as a terrorist anymore, by the way. He's a young man who was terrorized as a kid and he acted out of his own rage. And I know what that's like, because if I had acted out of my own rage, I would have been no different than them. Oh. Oh my God. Yeah. Is that what you put in the document? Yes. Well, what's, what, what's brilliant? No. I didn't put that specific piece in, in the document okay. then. I but did you realize it then? Not, I did not realize to the degree I realized it to some degree at that stage, but I learned more as I forgave and I got on the other side. I became more aware of that, but I had an inclination, yes. But I wrote a six-page statement. The mm -hmm. first five pages were the impact it had on me and my family on every level. And the last page was about a paragraph, and I said, I choose to forgive you despite all of the things that you've done to my, myself, my family, my community, the other survivors, the world. And I remember this young man never, ever looked at any one of us in court. And the court proceedings had gone on for months. In this moment that I spoke those words, we had a momentary glimpse of eye contact. In that moment, I had the most overwhelming amount of peace of my body. Mm. I had no idea 
that that was going to happen. Mm -hmm. But I literally set myself free. And then what happened next is my healing exponentially soared after that. And what I realized was forgiveness, we think our minds tell us that forgiveness is about the other person. It actually isn't. Forgiveness is about setting ourselves free and releasing ourselves from the bondage that we have from that experience. And sometimes we actually have to forgive ourselves. Right. I actually, right. not only did I have to forgive those two young men, at a later stage, I had to forgive myself for going there. Well, I'm wondering what the full circle is of you, of your purpose in his life. I don't know the answer to that, actually. Yeah, I, no, I guess. And um, it would be interesting to know what that might be. I find, I find that, you know, because it works both ways, right? It's like, you know, you're on your journey, but at the end of the day, you know, he's faced with this person that he's yeah. harmed. Who knows? Here's, here, I'm going to share something that's really bold and courageous, and I haven't shared this um, yet. It's actually going to be part of my next film. So okay. I'm giving you a preview. You're the first person I've done this with, but I feel divinely called to do <laughs> awesome. it now. So Dr. Sue Mortar is one of my mentors, and she's huh? actually featured in this film. But she yes. will be featured in the next film. I had the pleasure of meeting her, I believe it was 2018 or 2019. Don't quote me, but it was either 18 or 19. And uh, her insights and wisdom touched my life in ways I will never forget. I was actually becoming a certified um, energy code practitioner of hers. And I was at her three day event in LA and she was speaking and she was speaking on this notion of a bus stop conversation. And the bus stop conversation as she describes it is imagine before we come into the earth plane that you and I are sitting at a bus stop waiting for our turn to come into the earth plane. And we have a soul contract that says, hey, I'm going back down to earth to learn how to love or learn how to forgive. And hey, Lauren, what can you do to me to help me find my path to learn how to love and forgive? Right, right. And you got to do something so horrific because we, it, and so we basically kind of lose our sense of some level of consciousness when we come into earthly plane and we're, you know, we're basically learning and evolving and growing and ascending, right? In this journey. But what if we're like, actually make this soul contract, I'm going to do something really horrific, but it's so that it's for your highest good. So you can learn how to love yourself and learn how to love others unconditionally, or you can learn how to forgive. I don't know, whatever the lesson is. Yeah. And I thought yeah. to myself, what? That is outrageous. <laughs> And yet, there was something like my heart expanded when she said it. So there, I knew that there, my mind said, that is outrageous, but my heart expanded. And I know when my heart expands or I have a resonance or feeling, for me, that is truth. And I thought, oh my gosh, these two young men are my soul brothers. What if they were there to help me find my way back home to loving myself in ways in which I had not yet done on this earthly plane and to be able to go and teach what I'm teaching now. Yeah, it's pretty radical. It is radical. And it's interesting, I've had a desire to meet the surviving um, young man, um, but, but have been told that that wasn't um, possible. Interestingly enough, and this was something I was silently doing um, because there was just a lot of animosity and all that in the community. And so I didn't want to, I didn't want to have that kind of limelight, but I actually was really close to um, potentially going and being able to have a private meeting with him just before COVID happened. And then obviously that, that, that went away when everything went into lockdown. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I will ever meet that young man. I don't know that our paths will cross again. I suspect that there, uh, I do believe that there is a purpose that I have in his life at some stage. I don't know what that is. It hasn't revealed itself. 
Yeah. How long is he in there for? Life. He's actually on death row. Oh God. Yeah, he's he's actually on death row. Um, many of us did oh. not want that, and for a multitude of reasons. But what happens is when somebody in the in the federal court system in the United States is on death row, they have the right to appeal over the course of 21 years. He's, he has appealed um, once already, and that's still in the process, you know? Um, so I don't know where this is gonna go, but what I do know is that every time there's an appeal, the whole community is relives it. God, because it's brought up in the news, it's brought up, it, they, it's like we're re-traumatizing ourselves. It's, yeah. it's actually not necessary. Mm. And someday I hope we learn as a society that that is, uh, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a lot to that, um, to really, yeah, I, I certainly don't like what he did. Um, and they're oftentimes, you know, yeah, I mean, there are often times no. where I think about, oh God, they should be like on death row when they do something absolutely horrific. Right. It's like, it's hard not to go there. And at the same time, yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know. Maybe it's there to build our empathy and compassion and Yeah, because I, I'll tell you, I struggled with it in the beginning. I I'm never sure. thought I I never thought I'd be faced with having to choose. Do I want him to die or do I want him to live? Certainly. And in the in the in the beginning, I wanted him to die at my own hands, if you remember correctly. Hence yeah. the healing the inner terrorist inside of me. Right. But as I started to heal my own inner terrorist, I realized, no. You know, for me, and everybody Everybody has to find their own path there. That's just where I got to. And I realized, no. And, and I, I came to that conclusion for a whole host of reasons. Um, and one primary big one is I don't want to be re-victimized, re-traumatized every time there was an appeal. Because we get dragged back into that. Right. Okay. It's not necessary. So um, where can and how can people get their hands on There's Got to Be More to Life, this wonderful film I saw. By the way, it's great. So thank you for sharing it with me. You're welcome. Yeah. You can go to there's got to be more to life.com and okay. it will take you directly there. You can watch the movie trailer. You can um, sign up to actually watch the film. We're actually giving away a free ebook for everybody that um, signs, you know, signs up and joins. Um, and the ebook is on thriving. We're actually going to be rolling out a course later in the year about thriving. So, you know, we, we've, we've actually bundled something really nice, Lauren, for your community and your listeners is that we're giving away an ebook on thriving. We've, we're uh, gifting people a free meditation, a guided meditation on receiving. So anybody that's wanting to receive more abundance, more love, more peace in their life, they can listen to this. Um, and so that's just for, for uh, watching the film. So we okay. want people to be touched, moved and inspired. Well, thank you. And thank congratulations. You. congratulations on your healing success. I'm very happy for you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me today. Yes, thank you. And thanks again for sharing the film. And it's been a pleasure to connect with you. You too. So everybody, uh, until next time, thanks again for joining. And um, you can go to the website, there's got to be more than to life.com. Um, I highly recommend it. There's gonna be a lot of interesting things for you to learn. Things might be new uh, for you, but be open. Um, as Jennifer has suggests through the film about asking yourself how you feel because um, it could save someone's life. It could save your life or someone that you know. All right. Take good care and thanks for joining.